Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Women in Data Science Conference. Um, we're excited to be here today among some of the greatest innovators and scientists on campus. My name is Kathy Eastwood, and I'm the manager for the new Center for Health Informatics, an area where lots of new and innovative work is going to be done. I'm delighted to also be the ambassador and the chairperson for this coming School of Medicine conference site for women in data science. This conference um, has been set up by Stanford University. It's an initiative that aims to inspire and educate data scientists worldwide, regardless of gender, and to support more women in the field. Women in Data Science started as a conference at Stanford in 2015, and now it includes over 150 sites um, across the world. Today, as on the program, um, we will go back and forth between local and Stanford University conference speakers. This is the third year that the University of Calgary has taken part in this conference, first hosted um, by the Schulich School of Engineering, and then uh, this year, the first time we're also hosting it simultaneously at the coming School of Medicine. Data science exists in many fields, uh, beyond engineering and medicine to include computer science, biochemistry, statistics, and many others. So you're all welcome from whatever specialty you've, you've um, come from. Why does it matter that more women are in the field of data science? Well, more and more decisions are being made on data uh, that can be very influential on shaping our world. I believe it's important to have diverse teams so that better decisions can be made that represent everyone. A few quick housekeeping items, and then I'll introduce our first speaker. First of all, all the breaks will be held um, in the atrium where the food was this morning, near the Libin Theater. Uh, posters and networking reception later in the day will be near the, near the um, registration desk in that atrium. Um, please plan to stay for the con after the conference for the, the food and uh, festivities of a social networking event. And uh, washrooms uh, you can find marked uh, just uh, to, the, to the left down the hall or um, below near the reception desk. If you're sending any messages out by social media, please use hashtag WIDSYYC to represent this particular conference um, or the WIDS 2019 to represent the Stanford conference as a whole. So for opening remarks today, I will introduce Doreen Rabi. Dr. Rabi is an associate professor at the University of Calgary. She's a clinical epidemiologist and health services researcher in community health sciences and the cardiac sciences departments. Her research interests are on sex and gender issues for patients with diabetes and cardiovascular disease, as well as electronic health records and mobile health devices. Please welcome Dr. Doreen Rabi. Good morning. Um, I just want to thank Dr. Eastwood and Danielle Southern and Alyssa Lem for inviting me to um, make the opening marks uh, for this morning's conference. Um, as, a, um, as, a, as a person who does a lot of work in administrative health data, um, as a feminist, <laughs> and as someone who's uh, fortunate enough to lead the Leaders in Medicine program here at the University of Calgary, I think a forum like this where we get together um, and acknowledge innovation and research in an area that's, that's bringing us forward, like data science, um, but most importantly, celebrating and acknowledging the contributions of women in this field is incredibly exciting. Um, and WIDS is uh, not just something that's happening here right now in Theatre 4 in the Cummings School of Medicine and the O'Brien Institute for Public Health, but we're one of 150 sites across the globe that is uh, celebrating um, and acknowledging the contributions of women in this field. So I think it's just wonderful to be a part of this global community and looking forward to the linkages to Stanford later so that we can, again, enhance the networking opportunities that are, that are before us today. Um, so, oops. I think we just need to <laughs> flip to my side. Too. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Danielle. So sorry about that. But um, so I think 
having a day like today is important for three key reasons. And the first is that the future belongs to big data and those that understand it. Um, and we uh, are all highly invested in the area of data and data science um, and having the skills and the ability to um, analyze data, understand it, ask it the right questions and, and tell the stories that, that come from it is incredibly powerful. Um, and this is a, uh, just a, an infographic from a study by LinkedIn Analytics um, that just look at the, uh, that just sort of illustrates how many um, jobs and, and how many opportunities are available in the field of uh, data science and analytics. So this study from 2015 uh, illustrated at that time in the US nearly 2.4 million jobs were available in this field. Um, and the number of opportunities available in data science was expected to grow by 15% in the next five years. So this is an extraordinarily diverse, rapidly expanding field. Um, and so again, there's, there's a lot of opportunities available for those who, who, who want to go there. Um, and I think it's, a, it's an incredible space for, for women to, to show their skills and talents. Um, we know that this is a rapidly, uh, a rapidly growing sector of our economy. Um, and information and communication technologies contribute 7% to our national GDP. So this is a space where we really can make a mark. The second reason I think that a day like today is important is, is that women have a very important role to play in the advancement of data science. And as Dr. Eastwood mentioned, I think that women have um, a unique voice, a unique perspective that they bring to this area, and I don't think we can um, I don't think we can say enough about how important that particular view is. And I just want to, just if you could just allow me a little bit of, uh, uh, of latitude here to discuss about my personal experiences in this field. So I began my career, um, as, as Dr. Eastwood mentioned, with a real interest in sex and gender determinants of cardiovascular disease and, and diabetes. And I had the good fortune of working with a team called Genesis that was led by um, a very, very impressive female investigator, uh, Louise um, Pilot from McGill. And we had this incredible team led by some incredible women, including Karen Humphreys in BC, Nadia Khan in BC, Colleen Norris locally. Um, and uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful experience for us to, to really look at um, a number of, of data sets, link them together in creative ways, and analyze them to ask very important questions about women's cardiovascular health. And in that exercise, we identified a number of things that hadn't been seen before. We identified that women have very different rates of cardiovascular disease relative to men. We also identified that women have very different experiences of cardiovascular disease and have different symptom um, uh, complexes. We also identified that women have very different healthcare experiences when they present with symptoms of coronary artery disease. Um, and we also identified that women have very different outcomes. Women, unfortunately, have more morbidity associated with cardiovascular disease and are less likely to engage in important preventative programs that would, that would help improve their survival far, following uh, a cardiac event. Um, and while we have a, a long way to go in terms of addressing all of these, these gaps in, in the care of women with heart disease, I think what's really, really important and what forums like this help facilitate is that you know, women have important questions to ask and we bring very unique perspectives to, to the region of data science. And I think representation matters. If we didn't have women coming in and asking these questions and challenging each other on, on, on issues important to, to, to women's health, we would still be in the dark about some of these issues. And I think the other thing that we have to acknowledge is that women just do really good work. And I think it's wonderful to have an opportunity to celebrate those successes. Um, and it's also important to recognize that women don't work in isolation and they work with wonderful male team members and male allies that also facilitate the success. Um, and I think that we're learning more and more and more about the unique contribution that women make to their various fields. In medicine, we know that, that women are excellent physicians. Um, there, are, there is evidence from large data sets that illustrate that women physicians uh, have a um, perhaps nominally small but statistically significant um, uh, positive impact on their, their, their patients' um, uh, outcomes. Women have lower mortality rates and uh, fewer Re -hospital, uh, re hospital readmissions relative to the male peers. We also know that um, from recent evidence looking at sort of our success rates at CIHR that women score extraordinarily well in their grant applications. Um, and we also know from looking at business that um, uh, there is an extraordinary uh, economic opportunity in, in allowing um, uh, and encouraging women to succeed. Um, we know that closing the gender gap 
in um, uh, data science and in, and, and in an industry in general, that if we empower women to reach their potential, that this could lead to the addition of 10 to $17 trillion to the world economy. Women have a lot of value that's currently just not being, not being uh, fully appreciated. We also know that um, in the startup community, that, w that startups led by women are 35% more profitable than those led by men. Um, and a company's chance of success is improved enormously by engaging women um, in their marketing strategies. There's an appreciation that women are significantly different from men, and talking to women is important in terms of optimizing the success of their businesses. However, we also know that there's a significant gap. Um, in terms of women's, the, the opportunities that women get, the support that they get to succeed in, 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 many, in many domains. Um, and in the uh, US, um, only 10 to 25% of women that are holding leadership positions in the IT field are women. Um, we also know that only 15% of chief uh, or the C-suite jobs are held by women. And on average, women learn about, or earn about 11 cents less than men in the IT field. And it's, it's even greater in some of the academic fields. So we know that there's a lot of opportunity for women, but we also know that there's a lot of barriers to their success. And convening days like today to talk about some of those challenges and, and, and help identify ways to, to break barriers and, and create opportunities for women, I think is incredibly important. So and the third reason I think today, uh, days like today are, are, are important to hold is that the empowerment of women and girls in data science can have positive societal impacts. Um, and in particular, the United Nations um, has articulated that uh, in their sustainable uh, goals and uh, sorry, their sustainable development goals, that empowering women and girls, particularly in the fields of, of STEM and information communica communication technologies, is foundational to the su success of those goals. So we know that it just makes good economic sense to recognize the potential of women, to give them the tools they need to be successful, um, and unleash them onto the world, because we'll all benefit from, from closing those gaps and empowering women and girls to, to reach their full potential, particularly in this space. So with that, I am going to turn the morning back to, to Dr. Eastwood, and thank you again for um, uh, welcoming me to, to, to open these, uh, to open this uh, exciting day. And just before I pass it back, I should also just acknowledge that this land is the traditional territory of the people of Treaty 7 in Southern Alberta. Um, and the city of Calgary is also the home of the Métis Nation and um, uh, in Alberta Region 3. So again, thank you very much. I hope you really enjoy the day and I look forward to meeting many of you and connecting and, and, and sharing ideas and, and, uh, and talking about future collaborations. So thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Rabi. Um, let's see. Just a note before I go on that uh, we will be keeping fairly strict time. I forgot to say that earlier, but because we are linking to Stanford, uh, we're doing great so far, uh, but we will be sending reminders to speakers and just trying to do our best to come back after breaks when we say that we need you here so that we will, that we will start rolling whether you're here or not. <laughs> Um, so our first keynote speaker is Dr. Lisa Lix, who's come all the way from Manitoba, the University of Manitoba, where she's a full professor and director of the Data Science Unit in the George and Fay Yee Center for Healthcare Innovation. Her expertise spans health services research methodologies, data quality analyses, and robust statistical methods for patient reported outcomes. We invited Lisa to share about her data science environment in Manitoba and where she's played a huge part in some of the great advances. She's a skilled collaborator and I bet she's encountered some great challenges as she brings together diverse teams and develops training programs for data science in Manitoba. Please welcome Dr. Lisa Lix. I'm just going to come out this way so that I can, uh, I'm not hiding behind, let's see, this will work. Great. Well, thank you so much 
Kathy, and thanks to everyone who has organized this event and for the opportunity to come and join you today. I must say, though, that there is no improvement in weather coming from Winnipeg to Calgary today. I think it was about minus 28 when I left last night, and I expected maybe a bit of reprieve, but not quite yet. So uh, as I said, I've been, I'm tired of living in my ski pants, and I'm sure other people are right now as well. So, uh, but it's wonderful to be able to come and uh, share the experiences that I've had in Manitoba, um, and uh, specifically talking about the role that I play in terms of our data science group in the Georgian Fayy Center for Healthcare Innovation. I'll talk about that, um, and my experiences also um, in the area where my Canada Research Chair was announced in the fall, um, focusing on uh, electronic health data quality. Um, so to start, I want to ground myself in a perspective of um, data science that comes from the American Statistical Association, which is uh, one of the professional associations that I belong to. And uh, very specifically, the American Statistical Association came out in 2015 with a statement um, on the role of statistics in data science. And as a statistician, I identify uh, most closely with that, but where does that fit within the whole realm of what we call data science? Um, and um, uh, the American Statistical Association said, well, you know, there's, there's no consensus on what, when we talk about data science, what exactly that is. Uh, but it tends to be grounded in three main areas, is what uh, the um, professionals at the association thought. Uh, that it was around database management, uh, which focuses on data curation, storage, all of the innovative research that goes along with recognizing the vast amounts of primary data and secondary data that are the underpinnings of much of the work that is done when we think about data science. And then the second area was around statistical and machine learning. And I tack on the statistical part because that's very important. We could, we could go just into the realm of machine learning, but I think that underscores the importance of some of the theory uh, piece that comes in particular from um, the statistical realm. And then the last was in systems, in computing systems, and really thinking about uh, both distributed and parallel systems. So this was the perspective of the American Statistical Association in terms of what data science represents. And so I primarily operate in the first and the second spheres, and I'll talk probably less about the, the third sphere today um, as I uh, go through my remarks. Um, and so that provides a nice, I thought it, it really underscored the work that we do, um, sorry, there we go, um, in Manitoba uh, and elsewhere. And thinking about the statistical and machine learning um, is really grounded in three main areas as well, in terms of supervised learning where we've got some truth uh, that is the basis for learning rules or algorithms or decisions, um, unsupervised learning where we're really thinking just about how we can group and classify individuals based on uh, a plethora of characteristics that we would have, um, and then the reinforcement learning which focuses on some of the real-time decision making and also in the robotic sphere, um, which I tend to operate less in. Um, and within this, uh, so the data science platform that I lead in the Georgian Fayy Center for Healthcare Innovation, and we're a partnership between our largest health region in Manitoba, which is the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, um, and the University of Manitoba. And so we focus in three main areas, and I think it links nicely to that definition of data science, um, in that we have a group that focuses on clinical research data very specifically, so the kinds of data that might arise in clinical settings with registries of patients and um, other kinds of real-time data as well. Uh, we focus in the realm of bioinformatics, where we're thinking about biological data and analysis techniques. And then our biostatistics group, which thinks a lot about the statistical sciences and how they relate to this sphere. And our activities are in collaboration. We do original methodological research, and we spend a lot of time in training. And Doreen, I appreciate the comments that you've made about where 
women fit with, uh, within all of this. Uh, we're very fortunate to have collaborations um, across a variety of kinds of teams. I, I believe our philosophy is we never say no to anyone because there's always something to be learned. And, um, and I really value that opportunity to learn by participating in new projects. Um, our methodological development through research um, has brought in a diverse range of individuals to our projects, and I think that that's important, and training. So we do a variety of kinds of training, including internships and co-op placements, where we have very bright young individuals who will come and join us and spend some time um, learning about the data science environment, um, and particularly the interface between very good data and improving data, and also the methodologies that we can develop from that. Okay, so with that background, what I'm going to do today in my talk uh, is focus on a couple of different projects that I think emphasize uh, the data science perspective and the methods that we are developing in this realm. And I'm going to focus on models for patient reported outcomes. And then I'm also going to talk about longitudinal data analysis techniques. Um, then I'm also going to describe for you one training program we have that really um, has a data science uh, perspective, the VEDA, or Visual and um, Automated Disease Analytics Program that we've started at the University of Manitoba. And uh, across all of this, I'll emphasize uh, both uh, data science perspectives and collaborations. And in my conclusions, I want to talk about the unique opportunities that I think exist across Western Canada for the work that we do. All right. Okay, so first of all, starting off talking about patient reported outcomes and the opportunities that exist there within the data science realm. So patient reported outcomes refer to uh, what we collect from individuals around their perspectives on their own health. So this could include things like quality of life, like functional outcomes, how people perceive themselves, as well as satisfaction with the healthcare system. Increasingly, we recognize that objective measures of health are not the be-all and the end-all when it comes to thinking holistically about health, that the patient's perspective is important, and being able to have influence on that through the provision of care and treatments is increasingly where we want to move within our healthcare system and as we think about decisions that are made in the healthcare system. But patient reported outcomes are tricky in terms of collection of the data, in terms of management of the data that arise from patient reported outcomes, but there are also at the same time many opportunities that exist with these data. The ability to link across many different kinds of data resources, and that's something that we're doing in Manitoba, to be able to present new models for how we can think about and analyze the data also represents an exciting opportunity. Statistical and machine learning plays a critical part of that, connecting together interdisciplinary teams that include clinicians, that include statisticians, computer scientists, and population health professionals is also very important when we think about patient reported outcomes. When we think about models for patient reported outcomes, we often think about latent variable models, and they can benefit very much from the data science perspective. When we think about, about issues such as dimension reduction or clustering groups of patients, uh, in terms of their characteristics. There's huge benefit that comes from working with patient reported outcomes. What I've depicted here is our typical representation of patient reported outcomes, such as quality of life as a latent variable. So something that we can't observe directly, but that we want to make comment on and determine what factors may influence that latent construct. So inherently, though, we can measure a number of attributes of that underlying construct. So when we think about quality of life, for example, we can measure aspects of quality of life, but we can never measure it directly. 
when we think about satisfaction with care, we can measure different attributes of it, but we can't measure it uh, directly. So data scientists bring to the area of patient reported outcomes that perspective of the models for how we can think about uh, combining these individual items into some holistic perspective and also how we can think about the associations between this latent construct and the individual items that comprise it. And at the same time also we need to think about error and random fluctuations and how we can bring some regularity to that through statistical modeling. Now, the work that I've done in terms of patient reported outcomes, uh, we thought about how we can model as well as how we can bring together many different data sources. So in Manitoba, we have a unique joint replacement registry that allows us to explore factors that may influence patient reported outcomes, and in particular, worked in the area of hip and knee replacements. Not only have we looked at the registry data, but we've also thought about how it can be linked to, to other data sources, to administrative health data, for example, and to real-time data that can, be, that can be used to monitor patient symptoms. All of this creates a very rich data environment in Manitoba for looking at patient reported outcomes in this population as well as in other populations. And we recognize also um, in studying patient reported outcomes uh, that there are, can be factors, uh, sex is a very important factor that influences um, change in patient reported outcomes over time that affects things like missing data that we must acknowledge um, and um, that uh, is important to think about in terms of outcomes as well that are associated with patient reported outcomes. Okay. Now, not only does a latent variable perspective fit well uh, in terms of the data science um, role in patient reported outcomes, but also thinking about sources of heterogeneity in our data. And so we use latent class models there. So recognizing that quality of life or other perspectives um, are in fact latent, that we can't observe them directly, and then that there are a number of characteristics that we may not be able to measure well that are also important in terms of describing patient reported outcomes. And so layered on top of the latent variables are latent class models that recognize various sources of heterogeneity in the data and that there may be a number of indicators of those um, that we're interested in describing and trying to get a better handle on. And again, computer science perspectives, bringing together many different kinds of data uh, is valuable in terms of learning about patient reported outcomes. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna switch over now and talk about, uh, let's see, here we go, uh, and talk about longitudinal studies and where these fit within the, the, the uh, data science realm and also the work that we're doing in Manitoba in this area. And the Manitoba Center for Health Policy, which is a resource of administrative health data, um, has a wealth of information. We house more than 80 different kinds of databases that cross both the social sphere, which are the colored ones that are on the far side, uh, as well as a variety of health databases. And they cover everything from acute care to emergency um, care to long-term care. Uh, we have um, clinical databases, electronic medical records, so a variety of different kinds of data sources. And as well, we have a wealth of longitudinal information that's available. In fact, these databases go back to 1970. And they, and increasingly, uh, were interested in both the individual health histories as well, we have an identifier for family units so that we can really look at the relationship between the parent and the offspring. And that's valuable from the perspective of thinking about the factors that influence health, not only the individual's behavior 
and but also how that genetic or genealogic perspective can influence health. And we can link to both mothers and fathers in terms of these databases. So we can think about the heritability and what comes from the mother and what comes from the father. And so, but also in doing this, we need to think about the fact that um, data from the 1970s uh, is very different from data in the 2010s in terms of these being administrative databases, so records of hospitalizations, of physician claims, and then the registry that underlies all of this. Um, and we're crossing also different versions of disease classification systems. And how we think about disease in the 1970s is quite different about than how we think about disease um, in the 2010s. Certain diseases did not exist when we think about HIV or AIDS, for example. Um, other diseases that are really modern diseases, such as inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis, um, have very different um, um, representations in the data that come from the 1970s as they do from data that come more recently. So as we work with these data, um, it has been very helpful to bring in many different kinds of collaborators to help us think about how we would cross these really chasms of data um, to think about how we can connect them together into something that's seamless and that will allow us to look at health histories over a long period of time. And then how do we also take advantage of the huge wealth of data here? So for example, one project that I'm working on right now, which is looking at how we can predict fracture outcomes, looks at the parental histories of mothers and fathers going back to the 1970. And we have a lot of comorbid conditions that we can look at, hundreds and hundreds, and so the data become very high dimensional. And how can we reduce that information down to something that's meaningful? How do we measure? Is it about measuring the change for the mothers and fathers in terms of their health history? Or is it just about whether particular chronic diseases are present and absent that's important? So how can we take advantage of all of that information in terms of being able to predict offspring health is important? How we, can we take advantage of the information about the individual and the family unit in terms of doing that? And so that also emphasizes for us the importance of database management, that curation, looking for documentation on the data. Um, and, uh, but there are not a lot of people who um, who have that longitudinal history, too, of understanding the data that's a, a challenge for us in terms of working with it. Uh, but we've been able to do a number of studies. Uh, so we've looked at um, how we can measure things like um, uh, hip fractures in parents and then in offspring and look at the relationship between the two. Um, and also the whole comorbid characteristics of the parents and how that may influence outcomes uh, in, in offspring. Okay, so um, as well, um, when we think about the wealth of data resources that we have for health, uh, we often want to measure the chronic health conditions that a patient has because these can be predictive of different health outcomes. And we often think about the breadth of data that we have available in terms of diagnostic information, uh, problem lists that arise in electronic medical records, procedure information that's available um, in administrative records, uh, what comes from clinic notes in terms of some uh, patient charts, uh, and even prescription medications. Um, and a data science perspective is around combining many different kinds of data in order to inform questions that we might have about the health profiles of individuals. Uh, but again, we can't overlook the value of longitudinal information in terms of that. And one of the areas that I'm working with uh, right now is around dynamic classification. So how we can think about using longitudinal information to improve classification accuracy. So when we think about classifying individuals using a variety of different kinds of data sources into disease or non-disease based on procedures or prescription medications that they have and so forth, 
sometimes there's uncertainty that exists in our ability to classify individuals. And so we might actually have an indeterminate category where we don't know where people might really belong based on information that we have at one point in time. But if we begin to combine that information over time, then we can update that using longitudinal information. And so that's helpful in coming to more accurate decisions about whether an individual has a particular chronic health condition or not. So this dynamic classification is increasingly an area that we're moving into and again benefits from um, a variety of data sources, from longitudinal data, from uh, managing those data resources and from bringing different perspectives and collaborators from computer science, for example, from statistics, from mathematics, and also those who can help help us with visualization of the data. So looking at those probabilities, for example, of individuals being in one class or another over time. And so that's a, a new area of research that we're working on right now in Manitoba. Okay, so that's an example of some of the methodological research that we're doing in the data science platform at the University of Manitoba, focusing on patient reported outcomes and how we can use latent variable models and recognize the heterogeneity in those models and how um, a, a wealth of different measures can help us describe differences in terms of responses to patient reported outcomes. The second was in longitudinal data analysis and how we can benefit um, from the wealth of data resources that we have in Manitoba to look not only at the individual and their health characteristics in terms of predicting outcomes, but also look at the family history and the importance of the characteristics of the parents in influencing what happens in terms of offspring. Um, and then the, the opportunities for using longitudinal information for dynamic classification to make more accurate predictions about the characteristics of individuals, particularly with respect to their chronic health conditions. So one of the other areas that we work in in the data science platform in the Center for Healthcare Innovation is in training. Um, and um, we have been fortunate to receive funding from NSERC for a collaborative research training program called the VEDA program. Um, and so we're focusing on training individuals in visualization and automated analytic approaches, such as machine learning models, network analysis, and similar types of programs, um, and how we can train individuals that come from backgrounds in health, in health informatics, in computer science, as well as in other disciplines, including the social sciences, um, to gain new insights from complex health data. So this is a program that's funded at the University of Manitoba, and we have partners at the University of Victoria. It's a program that uh, has funding for six years, so we began in 2017, and we will extend to 2023. And right now we're looking at ways to make the program sustainable. Our goal is that we're, there would be more than 80 students who would uh, be trained over the course of this time frame. Um, and students are in their existing graduate programs. So they might be in a program in computer science, for example, or in biostatistics, or even in sociology. But they come into the VEDA program to take an enhanced set of skills training that focuses on visualization of data and how to work with complex health data in particular in order to gain new insights into the data. The program has a number of components. Um, so master's students come into it for one year and PhD students can join us for two years. And all of the students who participate in this program will take a credit course in Foundations of Disease Analytics. It's taught at the University of Manitoba and then remotely projected to the University of Victoria. We have an intensive, a skills intensive summer school um, that runs for a single week. This year it's in June. Um, all students will complete an internship where they will go and work with an, uh, an organization. So it could be within industry. Um, it could be within another university, including the opportunity to travel um, in order to gain skills and um, learn more about the visualization and automated analytics environment. And then all students must complete their thesis work um, in an area that focuses on one of those two perspectives, 
with an eye to working in the realm of either infectious or chronic diseases. So this year we have a total of 15 students who are in the program from the University of Victoria and the University of Manitoba. And again, they come from very diverse disciplines, computer science, epidemiology, um, we have a psychologist who's a part of the program this year, but all have an interest in learning about how to work with complex health data. And also, collaboration is a big part of it. Probably the key message that I've learned in the past two years is the importance of plain language and being able to communicate without a lot of jargon in terms of us being able to speak together. But the advancements have been wonderful, not only in terms of the students connecting with one another and recognizing how they can produce innovative research that crosses multiple d domains, but also in terms of the faculty members who are a part of this, being able to learn from one another, identify opportunities to work together collaboratively to strengthen the data science area, um, and recognizing the unique perspectives that come from multiple disciplines has been extremely valuable. Um, our internships, I just want to highlight this, our students last year um, had such wonderful experiences. Um, some of them traveled, some of them stayed on site. I had one student, for example, who was at McGill University working with the Canadian Network of Observational Drug Effects Studies, which uses large healthcare databases to look at drug safety and effectiveness. We had uh, students at the Manitoba Center for Health Policy, one of my master's students, who worked on a wonderful project thinking about when we look at longitudinal health information in administrative health databases, how do we think about time? How do we apportion time when we want to look at trends, for example, across time periods? And what impact does that have on our ability to integrate different data sources? Um, and um, um, also to think about um, what effects we might detect with different kinds of health outcomes. We had students who are working in policy relevant envir environments, for example, with Island Health and the Vancouver Island Health Authority, thinking about the opioid crisis and what perspectives uh, computer science and social sciences and the statistical sciences can bring to both uh, conveying information, so how do we present information that will resonate with decision makers, um, and what are gaps in the current data that we have, and how might we enhance that uh, with new opportunities in terms of uh, existing data resources. So it's been really exciting for us in terms of the VEDA program. Okay, so I'm going to conclude now just talking about opportunities that are ahead. Uh, in these spheres of training, of research opportunities, and also of collaboration. All right, so um, the VEDA program for us has uh, been, um, as I mentioned, really helpful in terms of bringing together diverse disciplines and also across multiple universities. With our summer school this year, while we have restricted our attention to just students who are in the VEDA program, we're going to open it up. Um, so that we can have students that come from other universities and from other disciplines who can participate in that. So if you have interest in the work that we're doing around the VEDA program and would like to come to the University of Manitoba for a week in June, when the weather is much better than it is now, um, you can chat with me afterwards and I can tell you more about it. Um, I'm involved at the University of Saskatchewan with a multiple, uh, multi-university uh, data science boot camp that will be running through two weeks in June. Um, it's very exciting. This is being funded uh, by um, CANSI, the Canadian Statistical Sciences Institute, the University of Saskatchewan, um, and also the Fields Institute for the Mathematical Sciences, which is based at the University of Toronto. So across the University of Saskatchewan and the University of Manitoba, we've put together a wonderful data science boot camp that will bring together people from computer science, um, from statistics, from mathematics, um, and also from applied disciplines who will come from the health sciences and the agricultural sciences. There's a very strong environmental science emphasis at the University of Saskatchewan, for example, in the area of water quality. Um, that will be represented in terms of the data science um, boot camp. So I'm really excited about the opportunity to connect with that. 
Now, in terms of networking, many of you will have been at the 2017 Western Canadian University's Big Data Conference. There's another one that's in the works now um, that is planned for probably to late 2019 or 2020. Uh, and bringing together the universities across the Western provinces to network, to share around working with big data and also in the data science sphere. Uh, this is valuable for all individuals, but particularly for women in terms of making connections with one another. And then lastly, I'll emphasize uh, work that's going on with something called the Pan-Canadian Real World Health Data Network. This is a very large network that was recently funded by um, CIHR, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Uh, in fact, it received the largest CIHR grant that's ever been awarded, um, around $39 million. The goal is to establish a distributed network that facilitates and accelerates access to many different kinds of data resources across Canada, but it certainly has tremendous value for Western Canada in terms of linking together different, uh, different data centers such as exist at the University of Alberta, the University of Manitoba, and in British Columbia. The goal is to create a distributed environment that facilitates cross-provincial studies that can be done using electronic medical records, administrative health data, and also new data resources that may exist in the provinces and the territories. So when we think about um, um, unstructured data resources, for example, increasingly we want to bring in those kinds of unstructured data to inform the models that we can uh, build um, for predicting health outcomes, for example, or for describing groups of patients within the population. So this network is just at an early stage. It was funded late in 2018, but watch for developments here um, at the website, um, and you'll hear certainly more about this at each of the participating universities, about the opportunities that will, it will present um, to expand our ability to do data science-focused research across Canada. So that's a really exciting opportunity. And again, it will benefit all collaborators, but the opportunities for women in terms of working in data-intensive environments and for building collaborations and networking across provinces, I think, are particularly exciting. Uh, led by Kim McGrail, who's at uh, University of British Columbia, um, and she certainly brings a wonderful perspective of collaboration and inclusivity uh, that will certainly flavor the direction that the network takes over the five years that it is funded. All right, so with that, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. Um, Thank you for the opportunity again to come and speak with you. What I've done in the time that I've had with you is to describe innovative methodological research that's going on um, in Manitoba, but that certainly has reaches across Canada uh, around working with patient reported outcomes and longitudinal data. I've described for you the VEDA program, which is operating at two universities in Western Canada, um, and we hope we'll have a reach elsewhere as we think about training the next generation of data scientists. And then I've talked about opportunities that lie ahead, particularly in Western Canada, um, for us to come together in the data science area to emphasize the rich data resources that we have and the benefits also of methodological work to advance the data science field in Western Canada. So thanks very much. Okay, so I'm happy to answer questions. Huda? So with the internships, um, so the students, first of all, are given a stipend for participating in the training program. So master's students receive 16,000 and PhD students $19,000 per year. So when it comes to the internships, they need not be paid by the host site um, because the students are already getting a stipend. But we recognize that with, a uh, with the funding being provided by the host, that that 
recognizes the value of both the internship and also the student's role, the skills that they bring. So we, as much as possible, we like host sites to uh, provide funding for the students. Um, and if students are going to an off um, outside of their home university, they need to travel. So for example, I had a student go to McGill. We have funding within the VEDA program to support their travel so that there's fewer barriers to them going uh, to different locations. And we feel that's really valuable in terms of um, just gaining a different perspective on what's happening in another location. Thanks. Yeah, question here. Thanks for your presentation. It's very impressive. I'm Meng Zhe Wang. I'm from Alberta House, okay. working with uh, Larry Swenson in the Department of Data Analytics. I'm so excited to hear all these good things happening. Um, my question is about how we have this kind of uh, province between provinces, uh, cross province collaboration. A lot of things you talk about and projects you doing actually very interesting. Um, for example, the opioids, m my team is also looking at the, how we're doing the predictive model to find out the opioids overdose people, save lives. So I was hoping you can give me a little bit of overview, high level, what kind of strategy and uh, um, process for the collaboration. Okay, so uh, first of all, I, w I think the main thing to emphasize is uh, distributed analyses will work in Canada. Uh, so we have, of course, uh, uh, given the healthcare system and that the, each of the provinces and territories is responsible for delivering health services and ultimately for collecting data, such as in administrative data form or electronic medical records, the uh, optimal environment for cross-provincial collaborations is a distributed environment. That's one where the data stays locally, the analyses are done locally, but there's harmonization of the analytic plan. The Canadian Network of Observational Drug Effect Studies, which I referenced, uses that distributed model, and it has been able to very quickly do cross-provincial drug safety and effectiveness studies that do not require the data to move. Um, the Pan-Canadian Real World Health Data Network is also going to work with a distributed model. In other words, we develop an analytic plan centrally and we work to distribute it across the jurisdictions in order to run the same analysis in each of the provinces and territories. Now, Larry Svensson will be very familiar with, with the Canadian Chronic Disease Surveillance System with the Public Health Agency of Canada. Of course, he's one of the leaders in that also uses a distributed model. In other words, the Public Health Agency of Canada, when they want to do chronic disease surveillance, uh, builds a central analytic plan and all of the tools are developed centrally and then disseminated across the provinces. Of course, there are always challenges with using a distributed um, model in that we come to the lowest common denominator often in terms of the data sources and the analytic capabilities. But at the same time, it enables uh, uh, studies to be done efficiently um, and um, quickly without having to deal with the privacy and confidentiality legislative differences that exist in the provinces. Yeah. So I think that that really is, um, is the model to use and we have so much to learn about how we can do those distributed analyses um, and um, both in terms of, um, well working with real data I think is, is um, uh, key, but we can also simulate data, um, and I haven't talked about some of the work that we're doing in Manitoba about how we can simulate data that represents real world data for learnings across provinces as well so that we can better understand how to do distributed analyses. Okay, another question? Okay, over here. Uh, thanks so much. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on how the update process works for the dynamic classification um, model. So specifically, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about maybe the similarities and differences in this type of um, update versus like integration across levels or across varieties of databases. 
Well, you can use a, a, across many different kinds of databases to look for information. So how does the updating happen? Um, well, there are a few different kinds of models. Um, uh, the, uh, my student who's working in this area is looking at both probabilistic models and also machine learning models. So, um, and, uh, and we're learning a little bit about this because it's primarily been applied in prospective studies where you've got data that's collected um, up to one point in time and then you, you use that to build a, a, a model um, and then look at whether you have um, uh, really enough information to say someone truly is in one category versus another versus falls in the indeterminate. So it looks a little bit different depending on whether you use a probabilistic model or a machine learning model to do that. But you're essentially saying, um, um, do we have enough information? And it could be across many different data features or types uh, that we're building that model. So what features can we use to predict who's a case, who's not a case, or do we just not have enough information and the probability is very low in terms of being able to classify. So anyways, that's a big picture perspective on it. I can provide more details at the break if you'd like them. Yeah, question here. So really a great talk, very inspiring. So my question was, uh, is, uh, do you see any opportunity to link the objective data with the molecular profiling data, such as the DNA and the gene expression? Oh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. The, the challenges in terms of, um, of um, uh, getting that accomplished around uh, privacy legislation can be, uh, and the consents that go along with that. Um, we've got a couple of small-scale projects in Manitoba that have uh, collected omics data and then linked it with some administrative data, but they're very experimental at this point. Uh, but I think um, you know, multiple data sources can shed uh, a great deal of light on, um, on uh, health outcomes um, and the characteristics of individuals. Uh, taking account of, I guess always when working with the omics data, the noise, right? How we deal with the noise in the data um, and where processing has happened. So those batch effects are always, um, can stymie our ability to, uh, to really learn and how to deal with noise um, is I think a, a key learning that we must um, uh, bring to those kinds of analyses. All right, anything else? Doreen? Thank you so much, Lisa. That was a terrific talk. Um, I just wanted your quick thoughts on, um, like, we're moving into uh, an age right now in Alberta with a province-wide clinical information system where we're going to be getting all sorts of digital clinical data that might be noisy, that's uncoded. Um, and just wondering your thoughts, given, given you know, your prominence in the field, on what advice you'd give to us in terms of what we should be prioritizing in terms of exploring that data and, and what your cautions would be in terms of um, again, sort of uh, going forth into this new field. Okay, um, so, so a couple of thoughts. Um, as much as possible, at the same time that you're bringing that data in to say, what can we, what can we compare it to, right? The, the data quality checks, so, so um, dealing with issues of data quality I think is very important. Um, the multi-dimensional perspective of looking at the accuracy, the completeness, the documentation, right, which is a big part of data quality assessment, what documentation exists about the data, um, um, the timeliness in terms of, uh, of accessing the data are all important. Um, brainstorming with many different individuals around what can we use to check that, so what are our reference standards for that, and then if we don't have reference standards, um, how can we use uh, models that really account for the noise in the data. So latent class models, which I've described with the patient reported outcomes, um, allow us to take multiple dimensions of the data that are inherently noisy and try to make sense of them um, within building profiles or clustering groups of variables or groups of patients. Right, so I think that those are the two main perspectives saying, well, where can we know for sure what the quality is? And when we don't have something to compare against, how can we use modeling approaches to do that? And computer scientists um, will bring, and mathematicians and st statisticians, and also data visualization uh, individuals will bring unique perspectives on that. 
And I think we have to go, right? Yes, we do. <laughs> okay, great. Thank Thanks you so much, much, Lisa. Okay, a lot. And Doreen, thank you for all your <laughs> wonderful studies and the training programs. We'll now begin with our vision talks, and our first speaker is Sylvia Zhao. Hi, everyone. Uh, I just have a question. Can you guys see the blue of the PowerPoint okay? It's not like you can't. Okay, awesome. I'm Sylvia. I'm a first year biostatistics master's student here at the University of Calgary. And I wanted to show you a little bit of what I learned last year. So specifically, it's on dealing with unreliable measurement units in EHR, electronic health records, using k-means. So this is how it all started. I was working on a project. My PI comes to me and says, hey, can you just find the mean weight of everyone in our cohort? Really standard demographic. And I was like, OK, it should take all five seconds, because you imagine it'll look like this. right? You got your x-axis, your y-axis, and a really simple bell distribution. You report the n. You're like, here's the mean. Here's the standard deviation. Super simple. And then when you go to plot it, you're like, what is going on? Why do I have all of these seemingly distributions spread around randomly? So now I've got a bunch of different means, and my standard deviation is massive. I have no idea what caused this or how to fix it. I have to tell my PI, hold on, this thing that you asked me to do, I actually have to investigate it a little bit further. So let's look into why this may have happened. Messy unit. So to remind everyone here, my example is just weight data, but it can be any data you're working with. That's the measure. They can be lab measurement or height, anything at all. So why did it happen? It could be a data entry typo, like someone, rather than typing 114, they typed 141. Or the incorrect unit, maybe they did put in the correct measurement, but in the drop-down menu or the check mark box, rather than selecting pounds, they selected kilograms, vice versa. It could also be a data extraction issue, where at some point, even though there are actual correct label units in the extraction process, we just assumed everything was kilograms or pounds. Or there was a cleaning algorithm, and it somehow miscalculated units. So that could be a decimal place issue. If you're seeing weights that's like 1.05, you might be thinking, oh, maybe they were actually 100 pounds, but somehow the decimal place got shifted over, et cetera. So out of all of these possible causes, what are some of the ones we can actually do something about these? So the very first one, there is absolutely no way for you to basically ever tell whether or not it was a mistake, especially in a case like this where it is not unreasonable that the person gained 30 pounds in between measurements. But for the other ones, if you assume it's sort of systematically caused, you could probably deal with them. So this is sort of my mantra. If there's a systematic error, you should probably deal with it in an algorithmically way. You should probably never sit at your computer doing something extremely tedious on like a thousand rows of data if you can try to come up with an algorithm to solve. So what are the, some of the key assumptions about this method that I'm going to teach you? You need multiple entries per person to establish a baseline. If you only have one or two measurements per person, it's really hard for you to tell whether or not this person is maybe very light or very heavy because it's not impossible. It's not impossible that someone in your database is actually 600 pounds. If you just have one measurement, you won't know that there's an error there. And whatever it is you're measuring, it should be very unlikely or impossible that a person will double or half their measurement. So if you're looking at heart rate, for example, and if it goes from 80 to 160, maybe that's not impossible. But if you're looking at weight and they went from 100 to 200, that's a little bit more implausible. And it's very important to be able to tell when there is for sure a data entry or unit error rather than it is actually a plausible change. And ideally, there are established units with known conversion between them, such as kilograms to pounds, gravimetric to international, such that if you do see these multiple distributions for your same measurement, you can assume that, oh, maybe they are using a different unit. But if whatever it is you're measuring only has one known unit, that makes it a lot harder because there's a less reasonable assumption for explaining what it is that you're observing. 
And you also want to make sure that in your data set, if there are these errors, most of these errors are systematic. If most of them are random, or if there are that typo, where rather than 114 becomes 141, it's very hard for you to algorithmically deal with them. So I'm gonna teach you a little bit about k-means. I just wanna have an idea how many of you have heard of k-means or have worked with it. Just raise your hand. Okay, awesome. So this will be very basic to most of you. So what we have, I have a 2D example here. That's the most common way of showing it. It's very clear. You have n point xi, where i is equal to n, and they're just the gray points that I've plotted. So what you do in k means is first you have to specify k. k is the number of clusters or centroids or means groups, if you want to think about it that way. And that number does have to be pre-specified. So you can't go into it saying, I don't really have an idea of how many groups I'm expecting to observe in my data. So here, I'll just say k is equal to three. They're the three colored points. And upon initialization, the way k means works is it picks three randomly distributed centroids and just puts them wherever. And what it does is it tries to find the minimum distance from every single point to every centroid and then picks the centroid that's the closest for each point. So I'll demonstrate with that top left point. So you can see you calculate the distance from the point to every single randomly generated centroid. You pick the one with the shortest distance and then you effectively are assigning that point to that centroid. And then you do it for every single point that exists. So now is where you calculate the new centroids. The new centroids are calculated using the mean of every single point that was assigned to that centroid. So like that. So at this iteration, you can see that all the points that were assigned to the previous centroid have now been labeled as pertaining to that centroid. And you just reiterate the process until your centroids have reached convergence, which means they're basically no longer moving or moving very much when you repeat this process over and over again. And I think from my illustration, it basically has reached very close to convergence because <laughs> of the example I picked. So now let's look at a 1D example. The 1D example is actually much simpler, and it is actually what I'm using when I'm looking at my weight data because I don't have a 2D distribution of my weights. I just have a 1D distribution of everyone's weights. And the way that it works is it would just plot, you can think of it as it plots these numbers along a number line. And then when you pre-specify k is equal to three, it says, okay, I'm gonna look at how close all of my points are to my randomly generated centroids, reiterate, and then it tells you, hey, look, looks like we've got three means. Here are all the points that belong to each group. So now let's look at how you might use it with your own data. So for each patient, you would want to plot, not plot, but I'm saying plot because we're looking at plots, but you would just put the numbers into the algorithm but you would group every single weight per patient. This is why you need multiple weights per patient, because if you just have one, k-means would say, hey, look, you have a centroid of one because you have one point, and the mean is just the point that you've observed. But if you have multiple points, you could do it. And if you specify k is equal to three, for each person, it would go through all of their weight measurements, and then attempt to classify them into, you can think of them as naturally separated groups of three. One question that I think are probably, pop, probably popping into your heads is, I don't know that for every single one of these patients, there's three groups. When I look at these weights, I think that, you know, for the first one, there appears to be maybe two groups, but for the second patient, I don't know that that's true. That is a really big limitation of k-means is that you have to pre-specify the k. So then, there's also X means. How many of you have used X means or have heard of it? Okay, maybe you'll find this interesting. K means is super powerful. It's very, very easy to use and a very big limitation is you have to pre-specify the K. And in the case of what I just showed, for each patient you would also assume that they have three clusters and that may not be the case. One patient may have a cluster of weight measurements entirely in pounds and they're all very close together and you might have someone else who has pounds, kilograms, 
uh, pounds like measured in weird kilograms and the decimal places off. So for it could vary very much patient to patient. So the way that X means works is that it uses AIC or BIC. You can think of it as a metric that penalizes the addition of extra clusters based on how much better adding these extra clusters makes your algorithm perform. And X means allows K to vary per patient, and it also, you can think of it as test of various Ks to find the best and most efficient one. So if you were to use X Ks, you would get something like this, which is a lot more realistic and a lot more accurate of what you're actually seeing. So recall the original example, you're the analyst, now you know about k-means and x-means and you're wondering how do I clean up this data and just report a, sing a single mean? So at this point you can probably estimate that the first bump is likely kilograms, second one pounds, and then the other ones, it's hard to say, you'll probably have to investigate further into whether or not it seems to be a decimal place, right, if the ratio is a factor of 10, something like that. The possible ratio is between clusters, if a ratio is two, sorry, it's likely going to be kilograms versus pounds, where the larger cluster is pounds, smaller is kilograms. If the ratio is 10 or a multiple of 10, it's probably a decimal error. So then what you want to do is find plausible or accurate weights as your anchor, and then using that anchor to attempt to convert your units into your accurate baseline. For all of these methods, you do need to have an idea of what is the accurate weight to begin with, because if your numbers are like one and then 1,000, it's really hard for you to understand, okay, what is the correct number that should be reported, because both of them seem to be wrong. And in the cases where the ratio does not appear to be either two or a multiple of 10, the case of weight data, you will probably have to manually look into the clustered centers and attempt to understand why you have these clusters where the ratio seems to be a little bit off. So I use this method using Sipson data. Many of you may be familiar with Sipson data. It's a huge EMR that contains data from all over Canada. And my inclusion criteria is from 2015 to 2016, age 30 and over, such that I wanted to make sure their weights were likely not going to be fluctuating very much, and at least four weight measurements per patient. So the data set size is 5,000 patients and almost 30,000 weights, and I just used R for this. So when I applied my algorithm, it looked like that 418 patients had incorrect units, which was around 8% of our data set, and that's around 2,000 rows of weight data. So if you can imagine attempting to clean all of that manually while sitting at your desk, that's more than a few afternoons. And using X means and R, it took less than 60 seconds. And I want to really stress that it doesn't have to just be weight data, it can really be any measurement data within your data set. If you think that there might be data quality issues, you could absolutely use k-means or x-means to look to see if there seems to be incorrect units or just some form of clustering happening. Because I know in my data set, when I look at the lab values, most of them could be either measured using the milligrams per deciliter or like nanometers per liter, and the conversion for them is all over the place. So it, that conversion unit and sort of the ratio between the two clusters of data you see will be dependent on whatever it is that you're looking at. Rather than using data cleaning for k-means, you can also attempt to create cohort subgroups if you wanted to use k-means or x-means to split your cohort up into natural divisions, right? Like if you're interested in um, comorbidities, you could attempt to see, okay, what are sort of the naturally occurring groups for a number of comorbidities within the patients of my cohort. You can also use it for optimization to understand clinic utilization. You can create better staffing schedules. And for crime analysis, k-means has also been used to identify areas of high crime using location data. As I've said, this is my mantra, but what I like better is not to say this, which sounds a little bit 
pretentious. <laughs> and to think of it like this, if you have to do something more than 10 times, you should probably make a program that does it. And I think a lot of innovation really does come from this way of thinking. That is everything. Thank you. So you're thinking categorical data that may be incorrect, or you want to cluster them in some way? I think, could you give me an example? I know that you can use k-means for more than just continuous measures. I think you will have to change it. Um, however, in the case of disease classification, if you think the errors are occurring in a systematic way, you could probably have an algorithm to detect it. It may not be k-means or a form of it, but if you think it is occurring in a systematic way, I think there's something to be done about that. Do you think it is? <laughs> OK. So I do think without sort of manually doing chart review, it is really hard to say the ground truth because even if I have, say, a weight for a person, and I think that weight looks very consistent. I have multiple measurements. They're all around the same weight. I really have no way of knowing, is that actually their weight? Or maybe it is a typo, right? Like rather than 115 and their weight was actually 116, is that still ground truth? So that's one way of looking at it. And in specifically what I did, the only way that I could attempt to figure out whether or not a cluster of weights that seem to be correct is whether or not I have a lot of them and they seem to be plausible values given for this person. So it is really hard to get a, like a true ground truth. I can only say, given the data that I have, I think this appears to be their true weight. And then based on that, I can attempt to like make the other weights match it by converting the units. But it is really, I don't know that without looking at chart review or something, you could really actually know if the data you're looking at is 100% correct. Our next speaker is Zhao Zhao Liu, and um, she's speaking to you from Community Health Science Department. I'm from Department of Community Health Science, and uh, uh, I'm a postdoc now, but I just began my postdoc in two uh, or three, three months. Before that, I worked at the Geospatial Research Associate in, under the supervision of Dr. Deborah Marshall. And before the um, research associate position, I held a PhD degree from the Department of Geography. So today, my presentation is mainly about the um, application of spatial analysis to deal with how some health research questions. Okay. Uh, my topic is about the um, air pollution and its association with myocardial infarction hospitalizations in Calgary. Um, <coughs> Air pollution is a major health concern, uh, public health concern according to World Health Organization in 2012. Around 3.7 million deaths were caused by, uh, related to air pollution, among which about 80% are caused by ischemic heart disease and strokes. Um, <coughs> many studies have uh, done research about the association between air pollution, myocardial infarction, and uh, uh, the look at the associations, but the results and the association are not considered among studies. The reason may be caused by different study design and different data sources and also the in, uh, different ways to estimate the air pollution. Um, 
Generally, air pollution is available as point data because it was collected from uh, sparsely distributed air pollution monitoring stations. But for health disease data, it's usually collected as uh, area data due to the privacy and the confidentiality. The mismatch between the two spatial units will have some uh, measurement error. So one objective of this project is to estimate the air pollution level nitrogen dioxide, more, spe more specifically in Calgary. We developed a space-time air pollution model to estimate the NO2 level in Calgary uh, at the dissemin dissemination area level. Uh, that's the data we have. In Calgary, we only have four uh, the red star point, four continuous stations in Calgary. It has uh, hourly data uh, for all the time, and also have eight passive stations. The passive station collect monthly, uh, monthly estimate. So we have 12 sp uh, spatial points in Calgary. That's the data source. From this trend over the five years, we see the air nitrogen dioxide concentration varies uh, seasonally. It's higher in winter, lower in summer. And also, we see uh, generally the, um, the higher values are in the continuous stations and also those passive stations located in the uh, downtown, in the center city, in the center of the city. If it's lower, if it's located outside of the city or in the edge close to the green spaces, the air pollution level is generally lower. So we uh, used uh, combined harmonic regression model and the land use regression model to predict the uh, nitrogen dioxide uh, over five years at monthly and dissemination area level. The land use regression model, I want to talk a little bit more about it. I'm not sure if uh, how many of you know a little bit about land use regression model. It's basically a linear regression, but we use land use as independent variables. The land use variable include the distance to major traffic road and the area of the uh, industry area, residential area, or co commercial area, and also some environmental factors. For example, the distance to air pollution emission source, uh, the um, wind speed elevation, we include all these uh, elevators, then use a uh, geographical information system to uh, calculate some buffers, then ca calculate those variables by different distance. And for our project, because we have done, we have some previous research on the land use uh, variables, um, we already identified so some significant variables to pre predict air pollution in Calgary. So these variables include the, north, uh, the wind speed, and also the air pollution emission, the point of the air pollution emission, and the traffic indicators include, uh, including distance from expressways, major road, and the highways, and also industrial land use and the population density. That's the variables we used to predict the NO2 level in Calgary. Uh, <coughs> we applied the land use regression model and identified uh, distance to NO2 emission and the, uh, uh, the distance to the mid, uh, major root length in 20 meter uh, buffers. The two variables are the most significant indicators to estimate the NO2 level. That's the result of this estimate. Oh no. Yeah. Uh, that's the estimate for the NO2 level in Calgary over the uh, ten over the five years, cover all the dissemination areas. We see the va uh, the levels changed um, over month. It's higher in winter and lower in summer. And also, uh, from the spatial perspectives, we see the higher air pollution along the major traffic corridor. That's the Deerfoot. Uh, Deerfoot Trail, uh, Deerfoot and the 16th Avenue, Crowchild Trail. So the traffic emission is the major contribution to NO2 uh, in Calgary. And also it's close to the industry areas, the Northeast industry area. So industry area, industry emission and the traffic emission, those are the two major contribute, 
contributors to air pollution. The next one is to explore the spatial distribution of uh, myocardial infarction hospitalizations. Uh, the data we collect, uh, myocardial infarction is from uh, approach collected from 2004 to 2013. Um, we used the Canada Census 2011 data and also the civic census to, as the standard population. The spatial method used is first Moran's eye. Uh, Moran's eye, um, it checks the spatial correlation, uh, odd correlation between the data. And uh, uh, we used the, the hotspot analysis to see if there's any clustered high values in the city. Uh, that's the result of the um, hotspot for myocardial infarction hospitalizations in Calgary. We see the biggest hotspot is in the southwest area. It's along the Deerfoot and also close to the southeast industrial areas. Um, <clears throat> the red map overlap with the air pollution level in Calgary. We see it's overlap with the areas with relatively high air pollution level. And we also stratify the data set by male and females. So for males, the hotspots are basically both males and females have hotspots in the southwest area. But for males, it has also have some hotspots in the north part and it's also the downtown. So from the hotspot analysis, we see there's difference between males and females. Uh, we, we further stratified the males by age groups. So we find hotspots for those specific age groups, but for females, there's no hotspot identified for females. Uh, <clears throat> other hotspots are close to communities with low social economic status and with large portion of older people, close to the industry areas, close to the major traffic. So the next step is to look at the uh, um, myocardial infarction hospitalization hospitalizations and air pollution and also some social economic status. Uh, the data we've already introduced to MI hospital hospitalizations and uh, NO2 estimates from the space-time model. Uh, we also uh, collected the social econo uh, the deprivation index from Alberta Health Service. Uh, we use the material index and the social index. We have the gender ratio and the median age from the census data. Mm. The method we used for this part is first the, just the global linear regression. I think we are quite familiar with this one. And the next part, uh, the linear regression, after linear, linear regression, we look at the spatial autocorrelation, the spatial structure inside of the data, then we applied the spatial autoregressive model. Uh, the spatial autoregressive model um, we can see here, we have one more component here. This one is the spatial autoregressive com component. Uh, the WY is just the neighborhood of the point of interest. We define a neighborhood and then apply a distance decay function to apply different weight to those neighbors, then get the average of the neighbors, then add it up as a, as a new independent variables. The row coefficient here <coughs> uh, shows us if the dependent variable has correlated, has significant association with its neighborhood. So we have added up one more uh, part here for the spatial autoregression auto model. And the next one is the geographically weighted regression, it's GWR. For this one, um, linear regression model is globally. We apply one model uh, for the whole study area, so the coefficient not varied over space. But for GWR, we apply the linear regression model based on each neighborhood. So when each object in this data site have a predefined neighborhood, it can be fixed distance, it can be a specific number of nearest neighbors. After we define the neighborhood, we apply the linear regression model to that neighborhood. So basically for GWR, we have um, the same numbers of models as number of objects in this data site. And that's all the models. Uh, 
The result is not that good, R square is low, but still we see GWR provide um, a better results than the linear regression and the, social, uh, and the SAR model. That's the result for the GWR, because GWR create coefficient locally uh, and R square locally. So we see the R square value the local R square changes uh, over space. It has range from almost zero to 0 0.8. And we see lower R square here, but we see high R square here and in the south, south area and in the downtown, in the northeast area. Those areas have a high uh, local R square. And uh, the map on the right shows the local significant factors to predict air pollution life, uh, to, pre to, to estimate the association between uh, NO2 and the MI. Um, we see here uh, the blue, uh, blue dots represent uh, in these dissemination areas, uh, nitrogen dioxide has significantly positive association with MI, and the, air the positive association is around the southwest area, close to the southeast industry areas, and also the um, southwest is the biggest area with the positive association with NO2. And uh, this one is when we account for the social economic status as well. Uh, we see still the R, local R square changes a little bit, but follow the similar pattern. We see higher local R squares here and in the northeast area. And for the significant local um, factors, the blue, start, blue dots, we still see the southwest area. Air pollution is still, NO2 is still a significant factor to MI hospitalizations in that area. So that's the very brief introduction of this project. Uh, we see compared to linear regression model and the spatial autoregressive model, GWR provide a um, better estimate because it captures the local variation of those associations. And uh, NO2, uh, for linear regression model, we didn't, the, and the global model, we didn't see uh, strong associations, but when we apply the GWR, we captured, we captured the local significant factors, especially for those in the southwest area. So that's the, the project. But I just want to <laughs> uh, let you know that generally air pollution in Calgary is pretty good. Uh, we have the annual guideline around 21.2. Point, uh, point but in Calgary, we see the value is lower than, uh, than the guidelines. So the air pollution is accepted. But we do this research because the air pollution varies a lot over space. We need to keep that in mind, especially for those people vulnerably and those senior people. They need, generally, we, we know the air quality in the city through the air quality. Uh, the health index, but that's the global one. That's for the city. When you see that index still, um, be aware that some areas for those close to the um, major traffic, the rush hours, or the industry areas, try to avoid those places. <laughs> Just to keep that in mind. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I want to thank Alberta Innovate Technology Futures and the Calgary Region Air Shadow Zone approach to support my PhD project. And also, I'm a postdoc now. I want to acknowledge University of Calgary, um, County School of Medicine, O'Brien Institute, and the McKeek Institute, Institute to support my postdoc. Thank you very much.
that kind of things. That's more like a modifiable lifestyle risk factor. Cost 60 percent. 15 percent is genetic, and 15 percent is related to the environment. So my question for you is: For this disease, have you considered about those modifiable risk factors? If we adjust that kind of factors, and even more like a genetic factors, how much correlation between the air quality and this uh, incidence? Uh, so for this one, it's just the, the spatial analysis. We didn't account for those uh, individual factors, those modifiable factors. But um, I also draft, uh, have one manuscript with another professor in the Department of Community Health Science. Uh, he, uh, we have done the um, myocardial infarction and uh, air pollution in Calgary. Uh, accounting for the modifiable factors, including the smoke, smoking status, and use the KISS crossover study. And from that study, uh, we, if we use the whole data site, we uh, find no association between NO2, uh, between the air pollution and the myocardial infection. But based on our air pollution estimate, we stratified the city according to the air pollution values. So some areas with relatively high air pollution, some areas with relatively low air pollution, then we stratify the population according to the, the residential uh, locations in the corresponding areas. We did find that significant positive association between air pollution and myocardial infarction in those relatively uh, highly pollut polluted areas. So um, those mad uh, we, we accounted for the, those variable factors, no association, but when we account for further the spatial distribution, then there's association identified. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. That was a fabulous talk. Thank um, you. Can you talk a little bit about the quality of the data in terms of measuring air pollution and also the impact of variation? So I saw variation that looked like it might even be increasing over time. So can you talk about the quality of the data collection and that variation as well? Uh, we collect the data uh, from the eight, um, the four continuous stations and the eight passive stations. There's measurement error in the data because the continuous stations uh, used the, uh, the, the instrument that's different from the passive stations. Passive station, uh, use, um, I think it's a kind of bucket, they have the chemical instrument inside, and then collect the samples, then staff will take the bucket into lab after one month to, to measure the accumulated measures of those air pollution. So the two, if the two continuous, the continuous station measurement and the passive measurement, if the two are consistent with each other, comparable with each other, this part is not done yet. I think that there's one air pollution air shadow zone is the wood buffalo. There's one air, they have, they, they've already done a little bit of work about this one to come compare the continuous and passive. But in Calgary, uh, it's not done yet. So there's error between the two. But we don't have data. We, we only have four continuous data. We have to use what we have. That's the best that we can do. And, uh, also, for the, um, the spatial variations, we use the um, uh, land use variables. I think th this one is quite uh, consistent because we have done one research, one project in 2010, 2011, used the land use regression model to predict air pollution in Calgary. And uh, we've already done another one in 2015, 2016, so just to, to compare the significant land use variables. So those variables are quite I think it's significant and solid and strong because it's consistent through the two, um, the project. Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, where could this one? So we have um, Renata, T Rina Tabata, sorry, CEO and founder of ShareSmart Mobile Solutions. 
at Think Tank Innovations. It's a healthcare communications company. Its flagship product is ShareSmart, a secure clinical messaging and photography app, um, which is being utilized by healthcare professionals in 71 countries who have chosen to take a proactive approach to safeguarding patient information. She's also a CEO and co-founder of Think Tank Innovations. And in operating Think Tank, she leans on her past experience of teaching health policy at UBC Medicine and on her recent experience of leading mergers, acquisitions, and business strategy development for a Fortune 500 company. Rena is the recipient of several awards, the 2018 Women of Inspiration STEM Trailblazer Award, Accelerate AB 2018 Alex Rexenko Award, and the 2019 UN She Innovates Award. She is also the 2019 Alberta Women Innovator, in, sorry, Entrepreneur, or AWE, nominee and Forbes Technology Council member, contributing regularly to health data and technology thought leadership. Please welcome Rena Tabata. Hi everyone, I'm Rena Tabata, CEO and co-founder of Think Tank Innovations. Our team develops solutions for healthcare professionals to collaborate securely with each other using their smartphones. Because we are in the business of handling large volumes of patient data, including their clinical photos, such as pre and post-op surgical photos, diagnoses and care plans, one of the things we get asked frequently is the applications of big data in healthcare. It's truly a fascinating time to be working in tech. Developers have access to a growing collection of structured data sets within healthcare and with that we've, we've been seeing promising applications of artificial intelligence that leverages big data. Just in the past year, we've seen the development of pattern recognition software that can look at the pathology slides and assess whether a patient biopsy contains breast cancer. This technology is being used in, in a decision support, as a decision support aid among pathologists to reduce the time to review slides and to increase accuracy. We have technology to automate surgery and help select surgical tools based on historical practice and surgical outcomes. Studies looking at the application of this technology shows reduction in patient complications, reduction in time required for surgical prep, and a reduction in the length of surgeries. We have software that can listen to 911 calls and know whether the caller is suffering or is about to suffer from a heart attack. The technology here, which in industry we call the chatbot, short for chat robot, is serving as a decision support tool to aid humans to triage calls, ensuring the most pressing calls are prioritized and tended to the quickest. We've seen refinements to software that can assist radiologists with the review of radiological images. Decision support technology, once again, for radiologists have been around for a while, but the precision and accuracy are ever improving, benefiting more patients every passing day. But because my team's work is about patient safety, first and foremost, Advances in technology utilizing large, health data, large sets of health data is worrisome. We worry that, the, that each new advance in technology could result in surreptitious access and, author, un, and unauthorized use of patient data. That is to say, we are doubtful 
that all technology built such that our patient built ensures that patient safety and their sensitive make medical information will be kept secret, safe from malicious use. And a couple of examples here. For the purpose of this audience, whom I've been told is comprised of individuals invited by the Faculty of Engineering and Medicine, I'll be visiting two principles within healthcare that aims to ensure patient privacy and use two examples to illustrate how current practices fare in the context of current technology. The first concept I'll be speaking to is informed consent. I think many of you in this room are quite familiar with this concept, but here's a refresher slide for those who need a bit of a refresher. Healthcare professionals in most countries are held to a professional standard whereby they are required to receive the expressed green light from patients to conduct a specific procedure, share the information with other healthcare providers, share the information regarding a specific health condition to a specific insurer, and so on and so forth. Now outside of health tech, it is quite common that in accessing the services of tech companies, we provide permission to the company to collect information on our basic demographics, where we are in a given point of time, where we go throughout the day. Sometimes we refer to, it, to that as geotechnology and even payment information. Consider what happens with an app such as the Starbucks app. I'm guessing many of you like coffee. I feel like medicine and engineering are heavy users of caffeine. As you likely know, Starbucks app that works on smartphones lets you order your cup of Java from the convenience of your smartphone. It lets you order your cup of Joe from the store you specify so that if you time it just right, your coffee is ready by the time you arrive at the store. You can even skip the in-person payment process. When you launch the Starbucks app, it suggests where the closest Starbucks is, enables you to access the list of drinks you might have previously ordered for yourself or even your colleagues, and you can even pay for it through a linked credit card. It's pretty convenient. It certainly saved me in a jam when I offered to treat my colleague for coffee only to realize my physical wallet was not on me. But the very same app that brings convenience is accumula accumulating large amounts of information on us. Which Starbucks location you frequent, your caloric intake, how often you drink coffee, at what times you tend to drink coffee, and where you go throughout the day. So in this chart, you can see that we're providing the app information about us in the name of convenience. When we use certain types of data to enhance a user's experience when interacting with the application, we call that a user experience. As developers, we strive to provide as positive as a user experience as possible making things more convenient, saving us time, and so forth. But when you look at the data inputs from a privacy perspective, it can be a bit concerning when you really think about it that a nap is knowing where you are throughout the day, how much calories you're getting from lattes, how addicted you are to caffeine, and how much you spend on caffeine. The stakes are quite different when it comes to our health data, however. Consider a mobile search engine such as Google. Running on our smartphones. I think we've all done Google searches while on the go. We've all used Google Maps, Apple Maps to figure out where we have to go next. 
what is the shortest route, where is the closest grocery store, what rating did the restaurant we're about to go to receive. In preparing for this presentation today, I took a fictional scenario and used Google Maps to illustrate how seemingly benign bits of information pieced together can reveal your deepest, darkest secrets. So imagine, once again, in a fictional, fictional scenario, I wake up to a burning satiate sensation in my nether regions. I notice that there are red, angry bumps in my groin that weren't there the day before. Instinctively, like many of you would do, I reach for my smartphone. I ask Dr. Google. Dr. Google suggests possibilities for my rash. To be extra sure, you can even use Google's photo image recognition software. So I take a photo of my nether regions and I put it into Google. I'd rather let Google decide for me how my rash compares to reference photos. I list out the symptoms in my Google search bar. I do this all from the comfort of my home, of course, because I don't want anyone to know about it. I then do a search of the closest sexually transmitted infection clinic in Calgary. I then use Google Maps and get to that clinic. I get my prescription filled, and then I go to the nearest pharmacy. But by interacting with my phone constantly, day in and day night, Google also knew that I had been visiting certain friends over a certain time period, where I had traveled throughout the day, and there are free algorithms that can piece this all together to illustrate a picture about somebody. You can imagine where I'm going with this. Google knows your deepest, darkest secrets. In this example, I didn't even give Google consent to piece together the information to come up with this conclusion that I am suffering from a sexually transmitted disease. But even without explicit instructions, it's gone ahead and painted a picture for me in my life situation. I think it's difficult to ignore the conveniences that apps bring, but it's not always clear how our data is used and how it could be repurposed in the future. So in the context of obtaining, sorry. So in the context of obtaining patient consent for use in technology, how do we go about doing so? Now I'd like to visit a second concept that we see in healthcare quite regularly. This is the concept of de-identification or an attempt to anonymize individuals. Have you seen photos like this in medical advertisements before? Possibly Botox clinics, eyebrow tattoo clinics, dentists, skin creams, perhaps even your family doctor has photos of creams claiming to do this and that. I see a lot of nodding. Blacking out photos to use patient photos on websites is really commonplace. But consent from these patients is often not obtained. Do you think this is an effective form of anonymization? Does the audience know who this person is? So I got a little bit curious, and being a scientist by heart, I decided to run a little experiment from the comfort of my home. So 
I took this photo of this anonymized person. I bet nobody in the room knows who this is. Using the concept of anonymization or de-identification in healthcare, I decided to take this photo and run it through Microsoft's free publicly accessible tool. The tool is completely free for anyone to use for whatever purpose, and all you have to do is upload two photos into the system. If you know how to turn your computer on, you know how to work this software. Basically, the software figures out whether or not the two photos pertain to the same individual or different people. Okay, so those of you paying attention have s probably realized that the left photo is of me. The present day me. I put a black bar over my eyes, just like healthcare professionals do in their advertisements. Somebody, is people in this room might have an inkling as to who the person in the right is. That is me from 30 some odd years ago. Do you think Microsoft free Mickey Mouse algorithm can tell whether these are of the same people? Frighteningly, yes. Yeah, it's pretty scary. So in the left photo, I have a lot of makeup on. My awesome photographer did a lot of retouching so my skin looks nice and even. Probably introduced a few shadows in there to make me look a little bit more flattering. The right hand photo, a little bit grainy. It's a scan of an old photo. And still, the algorithm was able to figure out these two people are the same people or these two photos pertain to the same person. Some of you may not be convinced by this example. That's okay. We can give it another go. So to prove that not all Asians look alike, <laughs> and to test whether the machine will yield a false positive, I ran the photo of myself once again, but this time against the photo of my colleague Elaine. Elaine's Chinese, I'm Japanese, but heck, who knows? We we're both in our mid-30s, making it a little bit difficult. We have similar skin tones, which also might present challenges for the machine. The hair is different, but I feel like the algorithm adjusts for that. And voila, we see that the algorithm was able to discern the difference between Elaine and I. According to Microsoft, not all Asians look alike. So in going over this one application of the identified photos, we see that there needs to be work to tighten the practice of anonymizing patient information or patient photos. Our previously held notions about anonymization is flawed. When we decided that blacking out the eyes is sufficient to anonymize an individual, we didn't have enough information about the technology that was about to come. We didn't know that our machines would get so good at piecing bits and pieces of information that blacking out our eyes would be rendered useless. Other anonymization, um, anonymization methods I have tinkered with have yielded similar results. Given this, the ethical co considerations and policies we build needs to evolve with the technology there are organizations that are trying to keep up with the changes. I don't have the answers to what we should and shouldn't do, but when it comes to assessing patient, accessing patient data and leveraging healthcare big data, 
the patient's healthcare professional, the patient's healthcare professionals, their advocates, and their engineers need to work with each other to ensure we are doing everything we can to safeguard patient information. Beyond the health information communication platform ShareSmart that we are constantly building and refining, I wanted to sort of share some of the exciting work we're doing here right at Foothills Hospital. So we're doing a neat little study through the collaboration with clinicians operating here, specifically in the burn unit that sees patients that have um, thermal burn wounds and chemical burn wounds. And this study involves plastic surgeons, nurses, wound care, therapists, and medical students. We're looking at how technology can reduce response times following wound takedowns. Wound takedowns refer to when a covering of a burn wound is removed so healthcare professionals can take a peek at it and decide upon the next course of action. Upon removing a covering from a wound, sometimes they, they might decide to close it up right away. Other times they may decide that the patient requires a change of medication or skin grafts. As the wound is exposed, patients experience immense pain and usually need to have a bump in their pain medication. By following the take, sorry, by reducing the response time using technology of healthcare professionals to get to the patient's bedside, we are finding that patients can reduce their dependency on pain medications and also reduce their long-term dependency on pain medications such as op opioids. In this study, a collection of burn images are being aggregated on our system. So when I say burn images, these are actual patient photos and photos of their wound. We're using the images to teach an algorithm to pre predict the prognosis and to teach it to be able to suggest the best course of treatment. Do we do a surgical flap? Taking skin from a completely different area unaffected by burn and apply it to the burn? Do we take cadaveric skin grafts and apply it? Do we do nothing? Do we spray cells on it in hopes of regeneration? We're working with the best in burn care in teaching an algorithm. But as we develop this technology, we are constantly confronted with the challenges of ensuring patient privacy. We think about the type of servers on which we store the patient information. So those of you in the space might call this data sovereignty. We also think about who will have access, how we will audit the information trail, Will there be a mechanism for patients to request for the information to be expunged or removed completely from a system? When we work with our engineers, we meticulously scrub information of patients' names, patient IDs, patient birth dates, patient geotags, assign new unique identifiers, and have a system to enable patient information can be removed. So I think big data holds big promises for healthcare, but the applications are really in its infancy. 
and we need more time to figure out a framework for the ethical collection, use, and management of people's information. It is a lot of work to carefully manage patient information, but the expectation on the part of the patient when they're accessing the health system is that they're in good hands. They're in the hands of smart people, and they're in the hands of people who truly care about their well-being. Patients inherently trust their healthcare providers who have taken an oath to ensure no harm is done to them. So my ask to each of you in this room today, through your work, is to consider that the notion of patient privacy needs to continually evolve so that con it continues to do good. In fact, so that it continues to do more good than harm. And each of you have a role to play. Thank you very much. Please step up to the mic so that um, people that are hearing this on a streaming service can also um, participate in the questions. Is this one on? Hello. <laughs> um, Rena, I'll ask first. Um, we are just beginning to deal with a lot of electronic health record data and so not visual data but textual often telling the story of the patient in a fair bit of detail um, about uh, what happened what brought them to hospital and then all that takes place while they're there it includes names it includes uh, family members names physicians names all of those kinds of things um, and so uh, through some of your technology, like uh, is there particular tools or ways that you are finding are successful in, in anonymizing data, especially, I mean, this is text versus photos, but is there something you could suggest? So today I've illustrated some examples um, showing sort of the flaws in anonymization. But anonymization is one approach. Um, we take a security and encryption first approach. When you make clinical decisions, you actually need to know the whole person. And you do a lot of disservice to the patient's specific situation when you remove bits and pieces of information that might actually be relevant. So in the context around sort of EMRs, having that full history on patients is important. Having access to previous lab records are important. And being able to access that in an efficient manner is important. And in our technology, we consider photographs to contain a lot of information that is very valuable to care planning so we provide encryption to ensure that healthcare professionals, when collaborating on patient cases, they can know with certainty which photo pertains to which patient, and the notes accompanying it are made available. So on the converse, it is really concerning for us when we see healthcare professionals using unauthorized solutions or using apps that might, be, that might be appropriate for their personal lives, but not necessarily for handling sensitive patient information. But I think there are, are many sort of methodologies to ensure patient privacy, and today I've just shared a couple of them. Hi, Rena. Thanks. That was a great talk. Um, my question is around uh, collaboration. So one of the themes that we've been hearing today, both from uh, 
uh, speakers in the room and also from Stanford is about uh, the importance of uh, collaborations to build, um, to be successful. And so can you talk about how from a business perspective th there's collaborations with academia or with government, for example, um, in order to be successful in the work that you do? Sure, okay. So specifically in the context of developing our technology, we work with academics, we work with all sorts of commercial entities to really sort of look at the best tools we have on hand to not only provide for a good user experience, but to ensure that we are deploying the best type of encryption and security so that patients or sorry, healthcare providers find it actually useful to collaborate with each other through apps like ours. On the sort of the notion of collaboration also, um, we built this app because we truly believe um, healthcare is a team, sort of a collaborative undertaking with sort of patients being at the center. Healthcare workers need to be able to collaborate seamlessly among themselves, have a unified platform or a place for them to be able to discuss patient care to come together to decide upon the best um, course of action for the patients. Can you talk about decision makers specifically, so those who would make policy or program plans within government? Can you elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, so it would be with, um, here, I'll come up to the mic. So it would be from um, those within the provincial ministries or regional ministries who are, are making decisions or policies around um, program delivery, for example. So beyond the frontline healthcare workers uh, and maybe a step up in terms of management and, and decision makers. Is there collaboration that happens there as well? I think it sort of depends on every organization. You know. Um, the degree of collaboration that occurs at both the front lines and at sort of the policy maker levels, what we've seen differs from institutions to institutions. So in thinking about our app specifically, there are certain medical schools and hospitals that have made our smartphone solution a de facto solution, giving it to the doctors and nurses, and in some cases the patients, to be able to talk about their care. But in under ins other institutions, um, you know, they've taken a zero tolerance approach to smartphone use. And so that has caused people to still continue to use smartphones, but in secret, using technology that might not necessarily secure patient information the way we want it to. Hi, I actually have um, three questions for you. Uh, the first one has to do with um, the topic being on big data, and I wasn't able to grasp the leverage that you have on big data on this platform because it seems to me that it's more of a security and a collaboration app. The second question has to do with a um, claim on this app or this platform on um, existing, I guess, more well-established collaboration tools like Slack or Team or even Facebook itself or Google Hangout, what are the different innovations that you have on this against these other four uh, platforms that I use regularly? Um, maybe it's specific to healthcare, there are special things. I'm just curious about that. Um, and then the last thing has to do with um, the bit on, um, I, that was a really cool example you had on the facial recognition. Um, where you recognized your younger self against you versus a colleague of yours. But I don't really see, um, uh, maybe it's because I didn't understand you completely, but I didn't really see what is the relevance of that um, in this special app. Um, and the reason for that is because um, if I were to share a photo via Google or via Facebook or via Team or via Slack, I would presume that I'm also protected under the privacy for those and none of the pictures that I've shared will be public domain. So the question is, how is this app different in that uh, respect in terms of not anonymous um, sharing compared to these other things, if that makes sense? Sure, sure. Okay, okay so it's a I'll bit try loaded, to three questions. Sure, uh, sure. Any one of them is fine. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer the questions in sequence. So I think um, 
data, data comes in all sorts of forms. And so in sort of in the context of our specific platform, we have collections of clinical images. And I didn't get to the specifics of our app so much because I, you know, this, this wasn't so much about talking about the app that we've developed, but we have clinical images, um, wound photos, photos of moles, pre and post-op photos. And many of these photos that actually come through our app are tagged or categorized by the healthcare providers. So not only through the app are you able to take patient consent before you actually even point the camera at them, you have an, um, an option to collect differential consent. So the patient can consent to their patient being used for diagnostic and treatment purposes, but also for research and educational purposes as well. And that happens fairly quickly in the, uh, through the flow of the app. Now, authorized individuals have access to, the, to ShareSmart. And um, in organizing their photos, they can assign what we call tags or keywords. So you might have a, col uh, a collection of, say, a specific condition, alopecia, say. So if you label the photo, certain photos of patients with the word alopecia, all of those get aggregated in the photo. And so we've got board certified healthcare professionals organizing photos, tagging photos, and then so we've got sets of clinical images that we can further leverage for big data applications. Now in terms of the actual sort of difference from between our app and say anything out there for that matter, um, so there's a lot of things that we have to consider when selecting or adopting technology for healthcare. So I've just touched on sort of a couple of ways to potentially attempt to anonymize patient information, but there are many, many other considerations like I, I alluded to data sovereignty. Where do the clinical images or the information about your patients reside? Where, what kind of servers does that information get transmitted on? So in most developed and commonwealth countries, there is clear guidelines around data sovereignty. In the case of Alberta, there is preference for your information to be on local Alberta servers. <coughs> Failing that, patient information has to be on Canadian servers. And so, you know, if you use WhatsApp to talk about your patients and you say to your colleague, um, can you look at this mole for me? Um, Mrs. So-and-so showed up last week and this week it's a lot bigger. Um, so that information, while certain aspects of WhatsApp are encrypted, it's not sufficiently encrypted. There's degrees of encryption. WhatsApp also has servers in the US and in overseas locations. So as soon as you have information being transmitted on foreign servers, you are subject to their local policies. So specific sort of to the US context, if your information gets transmitted over US servers, the US Patriot Act comes into play. And when push comes to shove, the US government could demand access to your patient information. Also, what we see sort of on the litigation side of things. We've got a team of in-house lawyers that re regularly represent healthcare professionals around he health information breaches. And one of the things that happens is patients will sometimes claim that adequate consent wasn't obtained. And in many cases, consent isn't properly obtained. Other times, paper consent is lost. And so when you're thinking about an app that's dedicated for healthcare, it's important to ensure that patient consent is somehow tied to the actual data being collected. And so if you were sort of challenged in a court of law, if you had been using, say, our app or something similar, you can produce evidence that um, consent from the patient was obtained. In, uh, and in our specific 
situation, you can show exactly where the consent was obtained, whether it was by the individual, whether it was by a proxy, and the authenticity of the um, signature can be confirmed. And so there are some protective measures for both the healthcare professionals using our application, as well as the patients that see the um, healthcare professionals who might be taking a proactive sort of approach with their healthcare practice. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you, does your system protect against deep fakes? Can you allude to deep fakes? So deep fakes is using uh, ML and AI to imitate other pictures or images. So the, so our system doesn't, thank you for the question. So our system doesn't police people per se or nor can it prevent people from taking a photo of a fake condition. But behind ShareSmart, we have a fairly robust enterprise dashboard. And so that's something that I didn't speak to, but um, we've got a dashboard that complies with all major health information privacy legislation, including uh, Europe's very, very robust general data protection regulations. So we are able to detect breaches and intrusions very quickly, conduct user access audits within mere seconds, and we can actually see a trail of how information was initially obtained, how it was subsequently transmitted, if it has been utilized or downloaded for other purposes, and so on and so forth. So in terms of sort of the best tools we have out there, um, we'd like to think that we've sort of considered sort of all feasible approaches in not only facilitating good patient privacy practices, but also detecting any anomalies. Thank you, Rena, and thank you for all your questions. Um,